Okay, we are live. Welcome to Boston Basic Income. I'm Alex Howlett. This week, we welcome economic historian Yaakov Fagan to discuss his January 2021 essay in Phenomenal World entitled The Deflationary Block. Jacob is the assistant director of the Future of Capitalism program at the Berggruen Institute. So a key point uh, in the essay, from my understanding, is that anytime we structure our institutions and policies to set parameters for the economy, not only are we creating winners and losers, but we're also telling people what they have to do to become winners and stay winners. Um, and after the stagflation of the 1970s, we adjusted macroeconomic policy uh, to more effectively prevent inflation. But the essay argues that these policy adjustments also had the effect of boosting asset prices, including home prices and depressing wages. Instead of getting a good job that pays a high wage, the way to be a winner in our economy today is to own a home and to kind of just hold on to it. Um, furthermore, the winners want to stay winners, so they'll try to prevent any changes to the rules. And, and Yaakov, what you argue, I think, in the article is that um, people are exerting influence to keep the rules the way they are because the people in power want to stay in power. Is that, is that uh, uh, an accurate summary? I think that's pretty roughly, it covers quite a bit of it. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to say anything more about any key uh, points in the... Sure. I mean, yeah. You know, what I kind of want to make clearer, maybe clearer than, clearer, clearer than I did in the, uh, in the article is I think... What I'm trying to get across is that, you know, neoliberalism at large is not just the conspiracy of elites. It is a series of responses, mostly unplanned, to a shock in the 1970s, which I don't really get into why it happened. We can talk about it here a little bit more. Uh, but that we should take it seriously as just a set of first of all, things that are relatively unplanned, and second of all, one that created a narrow but powerful you know, social base beyond the usual uh, winners you might think of, right? And that, that in itself is important to understanding macroeconomic outcomes. Okay, and quickly, how would you define neoliberalism? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. I actually kind of, you know, the classic definition to, is uh, essentially to test all government policies within the realm of the free market or whatever that is. Uh, I, I think that there, there should, should be, you know, an added, Jesus, I'm sorry, there's one call. I think there should be an added kind of element to it, which is also the, it, it, it's the, the, the uh, you know, the, I'm sorry, I'm a little off today. Um, I'd say it's the priority on the growth of capital assets over wages, even at the expense of overall growth, which is, I think, where we are starting to kind of, it's becoming more and more obvious that actually growth is a threat to this system. Okay, uh, so if that's how you define neoliberalism, how do you define capitalism? Well, capitalism, I think, is a very like many flavored thing, right? Capitalism is basically, I think, any society in which you know you have the dominant form of exchange being mediated through market relations, right? That's a really rough sketch. There's probably there's way more to it, but I think that's like a kind of you know like neat enough heuristic to get at it. Okay. Uh, any 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 system in which there's like a media through market exchange, primarily market exchange, and you know uh, labor is conducted through wage labor. That's that's I think a pretty simple heuristic to think through. Okay, uh, so do you mind if we dive right into a an excerpt from the article? Sure. Okay, here we go. So here you're talking about. Um, 
uh, central banks experimenting with unorthodox monetary policy after the 2008 crisis. And you're saying these experiments should be of great interest to those of us who want to see the creation of a wage-led growth economy. The ability of central banks to jump the barrier between the financial and real economies means that their power over the creation and limitation of credit can be used to quote unquote socialize finance as Minsky advocated for in his recovery of Keynes from the hydraulic Keynesians. Socializing the flow of investment in order to ensure broad prosperity will require institutionalization, perhaps separating the traditional function of central banks from a new kind of national or supranational investment authority designed to rationally distribute credit in ways that would neither be inflationary nor deflationary. So there's a lot to unpack in yeah. just this one paragraph. This paragraph is towards the end. So you've kind of built to this, but I'm kind of, kind of, yeah. uh, you know, cutting to the chase here. Um, so I guess the first question I have for you is what is a wage led growth economy and why should we want it? So, okay. In a Keynesian model, essentially, especially in a kind of post Keynesian model, wages are both costs, right? To a firm, but they're also the source of aggregate demand, right? The majority of us, we are able to get purchasing power, you know, from the fact that we earn wages. Even in a heavily acidized economy, that's where our liquidity comes from, right? And what do we do with those wages? We, um, we buy things, which creates profits for, you know, companies. So an economy in which the dominant, you know, dominant profit rate comes not uh, comes from wages is I would say a wage led economy, right? It's one in which there are very high profits, but a good majority of them are going back into the wage share in order for those profits to be formed. Um, and the problematic thing, and there's actually a wonderful paper that came out since I wrote this, which kind of formalizes this into, I think, a into a model is that capitalist economies don't do that by nature, right? Even if it makes sense in many cases to have a very high wage share to spur high growth, that's not a necessary outcome because in many cases, the capitalist economy will want a lower rate of growth, but a higher profit share. So more out of the total pie goes to profit than it goes to wages, even if the pie itself is smaller. So the desire for um, kind of the the higher wage share um, is connected to the fact that um, people are expected to get their incomes through wages. Yes. Is that is that right? So yes. we're in, yeah. in, any, in any capital society that is true, right? As long as you have production and some production surplus, right? There will be wait. There will be wages, and at least we would hope there would be. So there won't be slavery. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's not true. wages and everyone agrees to it. There's something else then we wouldn't be a capitalist society. Uh, so are you saying that if people got a large chunk of their income through something like a basic income, that that wouldn't be a capitalist society? No, I don't think so. Because I think the whole point of basic income, at least to me, is, is a floor, right? Not as a driver. Um, if you could if you essentially, there would still be someone or somewhere that you would need that needs to work, right? We know that for a fact, we also know basic income isn't a deterrent to work. That's what most of the research shows now. So in the sense of, you know, a basic income would be a floor, at least in my mind is a floor, but it's not necessarily a driver. If the COVID experience showed us anything, yes, like cash transfers, even if you vary them through the business cycle, can sustain demand, right? So they can substitute for wages, but there's still wages somewhere. There are always going to have to be wages somewhere. I certainly agree with you that there are always going to be wages somewhere. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to tease apart is the um, paying wages as an incentive for people to work versus um, wages as kind of the expected primary source of people's income. Uh, well, just, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Just from a macro point of view to me, if, like, look, I support a basic income, but if everyone's wages, everyone's consumption is primarily driven by a basic income, you, yeah, then you basically ended capitalism. Uh, you, that means you have enough productive capacity on some level in which people don't need to work. 
but right. I, I guess it depends. I mean, maybe we're getting into semantics here that aren't that important, but it kind of depends on what you think the core of capitalism is. Because if you if you're, you should still have markets that function yeah, fairly sure. well, right? They're so so if you're thinking of it as market. a market based economy, you know, you could they're have. Not mar- they're not. There's no market for labor then. Right, and, but if everything else, I mean, maybe there is a little bit. Like I think we all agree. Yeah, there's a, a that, that means price. the primary distribution of labor, which is like one of probably the most key inputs into production, right, is no longer market based. So then you have some. But I guess well, I yeah, guess yeah. what I would think of is if we're in this world where where wages are a pretty small proportion of income, presumably labor isn't one of the. But you could think of labor as not one of the biggest inputs in this particular society we're imagining, right? Yeah, Maybe there's a lot of technology. I, I and, but you th- know. That kind of society would essentially be Skynet, right? Like, in which, <laughs> um, like, or the, you know, the matrix or we're all plugged into some kind of machine, right? Well, we, <laughs> yeah, we don't have to beat this too much, but I guess I would just to separate out like the markets but, determining kind of like what's produced, right? Because people are voting with their dollars and like their different companies versus like labor as one particular thing that the market can, can be a part of or can be, you know, I, deciding I allocation. I don't of. think we can make that essentially that kind of um, like I think that is very complicated. What you just asked me, and I kind mm. of the best way I would articulate it is essentially if you're in that kind of society, you're in a post scarcity society, and the rules of the road of what we would call capitalist markets don't really apply anymore. But couldn't other resources be scarce? Like why couldn't labor be? Um, yeah, couldn't we not need very much labor, but need a lot of, uh, you know, I don't know, wood or something? You know, couldn't other things be scarce? I yeah, feel like labor should have other scarce. kinds of capital out inputs, right? That's mm-hmm. fine, and they'll be scarce. But at the point in which essentially you are producing so much above your other capital inputs that you're able to satisfy everyone's like de- like desires independent of their labor inputs, that's a that's a very different society, right? That is a society that. I just don't, I think we might get to one day, I would hope so, but that's not something, you know, any economist I think can speak to effectively. Like then the rules of the road, of e- I think of political economy are completely different. Um, you know, in practice, given the productive capacities we have today, right? We still can't get to Karl Marx, right? Each according to their needs, uh, from their abilities to their needs, because that's what essentially you're proposing here, right? I, I mean, I guess I'm just imagining it's a spectrum where you know there's always going to be probably somebody who wants to pay somebody to do something different than what they're already doing. Um, but in terms of paid work, uh, it's a spectrum in terms of how much we need. And I, I don't know every variable that goes that goes into this. Obviously, whatever the output is is one variable. Like right now, probably we could produce a lot of food for people in the world and maybe like basic clothing and shelter without a lot of people doing much paid work, but we want more things than that. So that's sort of a variable well, I think about, and, right? And, and I would I would disagree that we can do that without a lot of paid work. Maybe I'm overestimating because there's like yeah, distribution of the is, food and stuff, but I don't know, yeah. Alex, you, you might have a different opinion on this. Yeah, so let's... Um... Let's maybe take a step back and, and generalize uh, some of this discussion. So rather than say, rather than trying to guess about, you know, like what our economy is capable of or something like that. Um, so first I wanna mention that um, the way I tend to think about basic income is that it's a way of getting people money uh, rather than being a particular amount. So it's an unconditional income to everyone. It doesn't have to be a certain minimum. It doesn't have to, you know, doesn't have to be a certain maximum that you can't go over or something like that. Um, so the question is how does it trade off against other income sources? Uh, in the economy. Um, Now, there's, of course, a lot of work that people do. Most of the most important work that people do um, is not paid. uh, And the labor market is for when we need to get people to to spend their time doing something differently or doing something different from from what they would ordinarily do. So wages are an incentive uh, to do that. So the question is, um, the question I have, I guess, is um, even in a world where we need people to work a lot, would we ever want to boost wages beyond? Okay. Absolutely, yeah. because without that, in the end, you can't yeah. have profit, right? You can't have the incentive, you won't have capital, right? You like wouldn't have, because what is the point under a capitalist economy of creating new capital? It's to make profit. And where does the final realization of cap, cap, you know, profit come from? It comes from consumption, which is paid out of wages or other forms of income. Right, so some combination of wages. Yeah. And expanding and wage share should, if you have the resources, right? That's the kind of post-Keynesian theory of inflation. Less 
if there are resources, if there is capacity to fulfill the supply to that demand, right? That is a good time to be alive, right? That means the uh, right you, the means of like a golden age. You're having good growth without inflation. You've got a nice uh, uh, with no or low inflation, and you have a continuous expansion of the uh, of both wages and profits, right? Like that's kind of where we were, like in the say in the post war era, right? Um, yes, that is what we would call a wage led economy. So the question is. Um, if we have sufficient work being done um, at maybe, maybe part of what you're arguing is that we don't have sufficient work being done, that the economy is not growing because wages are too low and there's not enough. We uh, certainly, it certainly is. We, you know, I think Josh Mason and Mike Consul put out this great op-ed that some in the New York times that really sums this work up. Our economy hasn't been growing very fast relative to what it could be growing, relative to how much we could produce. Right. That's the whole point of something like, say, a Green New Deal, right? Is if you invest in, you know, into expanding the economy's productive capacity at high wages, you're going to have a lot of growth, right? Um, you know, and the loss of income actually does have long-term hysteresis effects, right? If you kind of just chart out the GDP path, like in the like in the simplest kind of exercise, let's say we go on thread, we chart out American GDP, you go and you take a finger and you trace the line up after 2000, the actual line is gonna be far lower, right? And the same thing is true with after, especially after 2008, right? And that's because since those crises, I, demand hasn't recovered. We've not had the kind of uh, uh, level of employment, right? And because of that, actually like our productive forces, our capacity has downgraded, right? The housing market right now is a great example of that. Um, one of the reasons at the moment you have have such high costs of housing is yes, we are, like in this essay and I've harped on it, yeah, like zoning issues and such, but it's also because even say aside from that, the housing industry itself hasn't actually invested resources and being able to build houses since 2008. In fact, it's contracted. So we're missing millions of houses. The thing is people's balance sheets, people's, you know, ability to purchase housing, you know, has only started, only started recovering around 2017, 2000, that recession, if I remember correctly. Um, what the pandemic did was it kind of like actually you know, tighten that process up. You know, American savings are on average higher than they were, uh, the, on aggregate higher than they were before the pandemic, just because of the amount of fiscal support we've put into the economy. And they're missing houses. There are also supply chain pressures, right? Wood, very famously, now everyone's going, oh my God, lumber is going through the roof. It's actually collapsed now, it's much better. But they're always there because of the pandemic, there are huge transportation costs, there are waiting times. So the supply side can't catch up in housing to what's suddenly a demand side. But what's even crazier is, you know, the people who cover this market will tell you that home builders themselves are still gun shy after 2008. They, our response to that, you know, has been, was so bad that the companies that should be, you know, expanding all else given their construction are afraid to, they're afraid to get burned again. They think this is ephemeral. And that's a real loss in the productivity of this economy. And that's a reasonable concern, right? When you see housing prices collapse as they did in 2008. Yeah, yeah. But why did they collapse? Well, because we didn't help the balance sheet of homeowners. We didn't invest enough in the economy. I mean, the Obama recovery package did quite a bit, but it was dreadfully small. Uh, it didn't really, and we didn't close the gap on the balance sheets. Uh, we actually had overall state investment pulled back in the risk great recession because, you know, the federal spending expanded, but it didn't do enough to, you know, uh, to cover the cutback in state spending. Um, so we, we had a tremendously damaged economy, one that eliminated household net worth that cut, that didn't let workers bargain for higher wages. We were all desperate. We all remember, the, at least I do, that was a formative part of my experience was 
graduating in 2009 from college and just not being able to do anything but, you know, like work I didn't really need a college degree for for a while, right? Yeah. So getting paid very low wages. And by the way, that has a, that affects your entire life, your lifetime earnings. And so that means you're not going to be consuming as much and you're stuck in a deflationary condition. So um, if I understand correctly, um, your, the, the effect of wages on aggregate demand um, or the effect of wages on economic growth, what you're emphasizing is the, the income from the wages uh, driving aggregate demand. And you're not as much emphasizing uh, the higher wages providing an incentive to build more capacity. Well, they are. That's the demand. Okay. You know, why as a firm, let's work in a vacuum, right? Sure. Why as a firm would I want to, you know, build new plant? Let's say, let's say I want to build a new lumber mill. Because someone's going to buy your stuff or your Because someone's going to buy my yeah. lumber, right? Yeah. If on aggregate, we, there's no one who wants to buy your lumber, or at least a, at a price that justifies that expansion in capacity, your own inputs, right? Then I'm not going to expand lumber production. So the question then, the natural question for me is, why solve this problem via higher wages rather than basic income or higher basic income? Because basic income, that's the point, right? It's the floor, right? What basic income will do was it, it will smooth consumption. I think that's absolutely true. I don't think it will, it'll create a floor for consumption to fall under. But the thing is, you know, and then it's, uh, uh, the way I will put it is, uh, of what we would call a fiscal impulse, say to a under or to a demand starved economy, that's a second derivative, right? That implies a move that that implies motion. So, you know, if I were designing a basic income scheme, there are many good reasons for basic income. I agree, right? But I would also probably have other things surrounding it. I would have maybe. Um, accounts at the Federal Reserve that have a variable savings rate that encourage you in maybe times of high inflation to actually not spend your money, right? Which is a much, you know, we're getting into kind of off the roads of this essay, but it's very related, right? Because an interest rate increase at the Federal Reserve, that's a broadsword way to fight inflation. That actually destroys a lot. This is a much more like granular, for example, way to do that, right? And it's a much more, you can target different populations, you know? I think what we've done and we've learned, especially from the pandemic, is you can increase people's, you can directly transfer money to people who need money and have high and have a high marginal propensity to consume, and that will sustain demand during a shock. The other way, when it's a demand shock, when it's deflationary, right? Like, but the whole point of this is they have to be dynamic. Right, because I guess those are darn I guess I'm I maybe Alex if I don't know if you followed that answer. I guess I'm still wondering if you think of basic income as a very flexible amount of money in the sense that like by definition it's not any particular amount or not even necessarily a static amount or whatever. I, I guess why then are you filling in demand gaps with um, wages instead of inflation? I'm not I'm not saying there's not a sorry, wages instead of a basic income. I'm not saying there's not a reason, but I'm still I'm still kind of seeing in terms of the demand side of things, they're both money, right, in people's hands. They're both they're they they might be you know, they might be money, but one doesn't respond to an increase in production or it should, right? I mean, if it doesn't respond to an increase in production like it doesn't now, we have a problem, right? We have very low growth. We have like a feedback mechanism, right? One is directly connected to doing things and you need to do things for an economy to work. Right. Is, the, is the idea that um, you're also trying to add in more of an incentive for people to work? Is that not the other thing that wages are doing? It's not. This is a very, for me, it's not at least, you know, in micro it is, but for me, it is about a return on surplus. It is how much surplus, aka extra stuff that's been made, do people who work get versus people who own get. That is a very, you know, simplified but way of thinking about it. I guess the, the real question that I am asking, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not following you, but the real question I'm asking is, is like how much extra money are people who work get versus just people in general getting, which of course includes the people who work. But you know, it's it like, 
higher wages means that it's in some way perhaps tied to the work that you're doing. So that would seem to be part of the explanation for why you would want to do it, it that way. But it's not, again, let's get out of this idea of incentives. That's a different category. What we're talking about is who gets to own what, right? You, as a, I work for someone, I go to a factory, I go to work. I don't do that, but, and I create ideally some kind of surplus in whatever way mm -hmm. we met. So, I am through my labor almost, or at least I participate. Like, why would I a create that surplus in absence of wages, other than maybe perfect creativity and desire? Like, I like what I. Do. But well, that's also, the incentives again, right? Yeah, now you're that's an, an incentives. Okay, level. but also, you know, what so what part of that surplus am I owed? So is this kind of like a moral argument that it's people not just deserve? A moral argument, right? It is a argument about where the rate of profit comes from. Because if, again, this distribution, an underlying distribution of surplus, I'm getting really Marxian, but like I guess that's the simplest way to get at it. That is also a driver of the direction of growth. If there is no this is where you know the, the multiplier comes in. This is where any kind of Keynesian system is differentiated from a classical one, say, or a neoclassical one, is that creating stuff, building new stuff, is driven by the need to invest in new capacity, which in turn is driven by the need to fulfill demand. Now, right. unless- so, Oh, go ahead, sorry, sorry. Now, unless you, you know, if you can separate income from the formation of capital completely, then you basically are, you know, in the old Soviet Union, they would call this the political economy of socialism, and that it should be thought of as a different class of political economy than one of capitalism. Because at that point, you need some form of central planning. Well, hold on. I guess we're just, I'm still thinking of the balance. Like I, I assume we're saying we have a certain situation now. We could try to do certain policies to boost wages, let's say, or we could, and, or we could increase demand via basic income. Well, basic um, income increases wages, not because, be, be, very, would increase the wage share, very simply because if you have some form of basic income, right, it makes it, there's a marginal like ability to not enter the labor market. Right. Sure, sure. I understand yeah, that that, that could be an, an impact, but I guess, um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if you, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe Alex can jump in here because I guess I'm still not seeing kind of the advantage of, or I, the advantage you're highlighting of wages versus, versus basic income from, from the demand perspective. Yeah. Do you want, do you have a thought? Yeah, on I mean, that? I guess the question is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing it too. Like if you're a person, right. Um, if a greater share of your income is not tied to a job where you have to work for some someone, um, you know that's that's better for you. So you know at the level of the macro economy, the higher the share of people's income doesn't have to come from wages, the freer people can be. Um, you know the less the less they have to um, necessarily work work to to earn their money, um, and that's you know uh, from the perspective of the people who are deciding to be workers or not, or deciding to work on one thing or another thing, um, that's that's good for them. It's more flexibility for them. So the question is, why would you want to, I guess, um, push wages above the level that creates enough incentive to get the um, labor and the economy done that you need done? Well, because you know be that because you need to have because you don't want to be in a stasis, right? Again, the driver of economic growth is fundamentally investment and investment response to aggregate demand, which is mostly labor. But wouldn't giving well, aggregate people money, yeah, like giving people money through a basic income would increase demand. Yes, and in it, fact, it would, it would it, increase it, it in a very flat way, as Alex often It certainly about. would, right? Um, but yeah. here's the thing, and this is the critique of basic income, and it is actually a valid critique to a certain extent, right? There are situations in which a basic income is consistently either inflationary or deflationary, right? Because if I get a dollar, you know, if you, if I, everyone gets a dollar, right? The question is a day and that's, that's a year or whatever. And that's our basic income. That's what we can predict as a cash flow. As a firm, I will fulfill the amount of orders that all aggregate 
dollars make, and then what? Uh, are you asking, and then what happens to the dollars that you collected? Is that what you're asking? No, no. Okay. And then what, right? And then what, where does the initial, you know, where does the growth, where does the, you know, where does the expand, like where does expand the drive to expand come from? Well, it'll come from population change, right? To a certain extent. And if you have enough advanced technology, then you don't really, that's not, that's the only rate of growth you're going to need. But, you know, there are other things the other than consumption that I'm just I'm confused in our society right if we need to build an electrical grid we need some level of you, we need an, like for example that's not enough if we oh man are you are I maybe you maybe I'm coming out of left field too but are you, are you talking about things where there needs to be kind of an upfront investment let's say by yep. the government because the um, it's not going to be profitable. It's not going to be like predictably profitable enough for companies or to do that I will, investment on their own. Not only that, right? Any capital good, you know, how consumer goods are ultimately made by capital goods. By capital goods, do, do you mean things like I don't know, like factories and that kind of stuff that companies well, own too? Like, like let's that. say machine tools, right? Yeah. So so let's establish kind of a what we all agree on here, you know, so we kind of get on the same page, um, you know, there, you're not going to invest in capital if that capital is going to go unused and you're not going to be able to use that capital productively. Uh, right. So in order to use it productively, uh, you need people, um, you want, you want to expect that, that people are going to buy the things that you, you are producing or yes. that you are hoping to produce with the capital. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, so I, I think um, part of the point that you're making uh, Yaakov is that if you give people money through the mechanism of basic income, that for some reason does, is not going to um, affect demand in such a way that it will um, give uh, uh, businesses the expectation that if they invest in capital- it, it, it'll, give capital some of, it'll give some of it, right? But I don't okay. think ever essentially get rid of the wage share, right? You just, because- in order to produce new things, you need weight. You need people to work, and yeah. in order to work, and in turn, those people's, you know, again, those people, that additional consumption also incentivizes a firm to do more things. I think. I think where I'm getting confused is like you. You say it's not just about the incentive effect. But, but the only difference I'm still able to hang my hat on here between wages and basic income is that the wages are giving people an incentive to work. But in terms of the incentive of the company the to, let's say, are, like invest in capital the, or grow, the, the wages are a return on your time, which is mean, needed to create surplus, which I guess is an incentive, right? But yeah. I'm not, it's, but macroeconomically, the function of wages isn't as an incentive, it's to form final demand. But what if you have basic income in the macroeconomic model? Like that also creates demand, right? It does create a portion of that final demand. So, but so it will I, never be all of that final demand because there will always be an additional layer on top of that that comes from the wage share. Yeah, so that, I, yeah. Let, let's, let's back up a second, <laughs> establish something else I think we all agree on, which is that there will always be wages. There will always yeah. be reasons to pay people to contribute labor to the economy. Uh, we're always going to have work that needs mm -hmm. to get done. So it's impossible that uh, the entire income share of consumers is going to come from basic income. Yeah. That's just not possible. The mm -hmm. question is, um, when we're at a point where we have the incentives in the labor market um, kind of at an efficient level, um, would we really want to to uh, boost wages for the purpose of boosting demand, or does it make more sense to, um, to go with basic income oh, at that point? Okay, that is a very different question to me. Like then, okay. I still think it's more important to boost wages because I think, first of all, I think people were on a purely economic level, it is good that workers receive an incentive for increased productivity, whatever that is, right? Not only, or I hate the term incentive, essentially you're going to fund your basic income out of a social surplus anyway, right? So the question is really that you get morally now, I, I, I think I understand your point finally, right? Is it basically, sh should we increase wages or should everyone get paid 
a flat amount X, all no matter what they're doing in their work, that increases alongside the social surplus? I mean, I think that's a fair question. I don't actually have an opinion on that, but that does meet, I think, the definition of communism. Because that is literally each according to their ability to each according to their need. Well, I think it's interesting because like it's we always run into issues with definitions in this way because it's kind of a framing. It's sort of a framing thing. On the, on the one hand, what Alex is saying is like, let's let the market for labor be truly efficient. So in that sense, it's like not it's like very capitalist, right? It's like, let's only pay people what you need to motivate them to do all the work that you want them to do and produce the surplus you want them to produce. Let's not add minimum wage to that, perhaps, you know, or let's not add like additional, you know, pumping up the financial sector, like create no, no, no. unnecessary. That, job. Let's that, not add but, anything. But again, in the, let, let's talk about very simple extremes and models. And honestly, I didn't come here just to talk about basic income, but let's fucking stay sure. on. Yeah. Um, there, um, okay, I, my job is shoveling shit and I'm going to be paid as much as a, uh, like as much as anyone else for my job, you know, like as someone who's like, you know, job is eating candy. I think for shoveling shit in a society, I should be paid more. <laughs> I think maybe there, I don't hope there hasn't been a miscommunication. I don't think Alex or I are suggesting uh, that there wouldn't be wages or that those wages wouldn't differ by market, according to market conditions. I think we're suggesting the opposite of that, which is that they should differ according to market conditions. So like, you know, whatever is needed to uh, motivate you. The thing to, you is, know. wages are a function of bargaining power. There's no such thing as a neutral market in wages. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, I, I include that as part of, I guess I include that as part of the milieu. I'm not being very And, precise, and what I'm, the point I'm trying to make, the point, the article Alex want me to talk about <laughs> is, um, is that that's not determined by productivity or mm -hmm. by, you know, some kind of marginalist uh, like theory. It's determined by pure bargaining power, is determined by social arrangement, mm -hmm. right? Whether I get $1 per hour or $2 per, $2 per hour is not my, a function of my marginal productivity. It's just not. It is a function of my, what my, I can bargain for. I think That's I agree I, with that. I think Alex probably agrees with that too, right, Alex? That particular point, right? Yeah, and I would, uh, but you know, like in terms of kind of just how I frame it, I would probably fold uh, all the bargaining stuff into supply and demand. Like that's just part of what but makes supply not. and demand what it is. But it's not right. That's okay. the whole point. That's what John Maynard Keynes taught us in the first, in the first kind of, like you know, that's what the Keynesian critique is, and this is what I. I bring. It's not about supply and demand because you can have involuntary unemployment if there is, and you can, and, but that there's a feedback loop, right? You can have involuntary unemployment if there is not enough aggregate demand, mm -hmm. but, the, right? But in turn, in turn, you cannot adjust ag that aggregate, you cannot get rid of that aggregate unemployment by lowering the wage because by lowering the wage you're actually going to lower the need for uh need for employees overall uh okay so so let's um so this can maybe link us back up to the to the article a little bit uh, yes. a little bit more um so uh in terms of what what is the um what does the ideal monetary policy look like? Uh, is it ever appropriate to prioritize price stability over full employment? And under what conditions would you say that these two priorities uh, come into conflict with one another? Okay, so formally the Federal Reserve has two mandates, right? Full employment and price stability. Under the, under let's say, well, not current, but it's still there, right? Classically, the way central banks see this is that there is a trade-off between full uh, between employment uh, employment between those two goals, right? There initially was this idea of the Phillips curve, in which you know the higher your rate of employment, the higher inflation, 
uh, like that there's a trade off between, you know, price stability and employment that doesn't really exist. But there is now a new uh, different concept called Nehru, right? And under the Nehru concept, essentially, there is some natural rate of unemployment that corresponds with the optimal inflation. It's kind of this thing called a new Keynesian augmented Phillips curve, right? It's augmented with expectations and stuff. Um, that's the way classical central banking sees it. Um, I see it a little differently. It's not actually that contradictory. I think the problem is that price stability central, like, okay, th that, you know, when do you start seeing, let's say inflation, you don't start seeing inflation at full employment necessarily. You start seeing inflation at full employment when the supply can't in very, in a very vulgar way, supply can't catch up with demand at full employment. Like that there's something significant keeping, there, there's something bottlenecking the economy, right? Uh, and that could be natural or that could be like an oil shock. Uh, classically in the 70s, we had an oil shock, right? Um, and it took, and partially because, and there was a feedback loop because the higher, the, you know, the, the, the more the dollar depreciated, the more incentive there was for uh, natural resource producers to form cartels, which in turn depreciate the dollar. And my argument, when it comes back to monetary policy, or the argument many people make, it's not just really my argument, I just provide a historical account of it, right? Is that, um, is that what actually did it? It wasn't, you know, Paul Volcker just raising interest rates and essentially ending the, you know, and like putting the economy into a recession, getting hundreds of thousands and thousands of people putting them out of work and into poverty right, by cutting off their ability to make money and thus lowering the price level. So actually it was building a bunch of oil pipelines. The Federal Reserve can't do that, right? There's a, my friend Skanda, who is also like hangs around around econ Twitter, like has a great qu uh, quiz, right? Um, his quiz is, what was since 1950, when, what president had the highest, uh, had the most consecutive years of 10 per, above 10% investment growth? Uh, uh, you should already have the hint. Is it Jimmy Carter? It's Jimmy Carter, right? You don't associate <laughs> Jimmy Carter with being this like economic powerhouse, but <laughs> that's where it's coming. That's under Jimmy Carter, right? And where is that coming from? Like most of that is under is like energy extraction and increases. Unfortunately, that went away, but increases in energy efficiency. And guess what that did? in the long run, the price of energy, which was this thing that would keep, you know, that kept the economy from fulfilling demand. Well, it lowered it quite a bit, right? And, you know, the, the thing, the general push now in the post-Keynesian community is to say, look, we need institutions to manage the boom. And I'm stealing that for Josh Mason. I think that's a great little line, right? And the Federal Reserve isn't that institution, or at least it shouldn't be the sole one. Now, what we what the Federal Reserve has been doing a lot more, right, is that it's been doing unconventional things, right? Like my dear municipal liquidity uh, facility, which never, you know, I think never got the wings I wanted it to, but was still an experiment in which instead of the Federal Reserve was pumping money, not to the financial sector, right, which can't spend, you know, I guess, again, this requires a little stepping back and I actually um, listened to you talking about this on Macro Musings a while yeah, yeah, back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like right because the whole point is traditionally monetary policy issues reserves, and actually banks can't lend reserves, right? Banks can only lend if there is you know someone who wants to borrow it, and then they will create money endogenously, and then the reserves are backstops of that essentially in simplest terms, right? But you know if you let if you buy if the Federal Reserve buys the debt of, I don't know, Boston, then Boston gets a credit to its bank account and they can spend, go out and spend that money because that's in the real economy. But that's no longer monetary policy. Let's be honest about that, right? What we're experimenting with are, is alternative forms of fiscal policy, uh, which is why the Federal Reserve is very hesitant about doing these things. Not only is that, you know, treading on Congress's mandate and treading on, uh, you know, 
treading on all kinds of constitutional issues, but they don't know how to do that. They're not designed to do that, which is why in the long run, I think we need our, a separate kind of something else to do that kind of work, right? I mean, classically, they didn't even know that much about the municipal markets. Um, the Boston Fed uh, was trying to run the Main Street liquidity facility and they were very much trying to lend to directly give lend to lend to the small businesses, but you know they couldn't because they don't know who the small businesses are. They're not designed to do that. They have to go through the banks, and it's, it winds up being that the banks have to do that work, right? Yeah. The banks, and you know that's not always. There's all kinds of principal agent pro problems there. Um, you know that was the same thing with you know buying, buying bond, buying uh, uh, corporate bonds, which like you know that. We didn't during this emergency. We needed to. You wanted to keep the corporate bond market from collapsing on itself, and they did that. But they had to go through BlackRock and Pimco just because you know they don't know how to do that. They don't have the staff to do that. They can't do it overnight. Like this, a very private. They have to go to a private market person to you know do the work for them essentially as a subcontractor. And again, maybe that's not ideal. You know, I don't think there was anything particularly wrong with that in a, you know, in a, in a you know, like in a hitch. Uh, I don't think there was any yeah. like, bad faith actually like in there, but it's not ideal. Like no one will say that's the ideal arrangement, which is why we need more robust institutions and ones that are honestly a little, that may be a little isolated from the day-to-day -day congressional churn. They can think 10, 15 years ahead. So you're talking about some of the things that um, maybe the Fed had to do in an emergency that it doesn't really make sense uh, to do as monetary policy normally. By a monetary policy institution normally. Yeah. Um, so I guess my, que my next question for you is, let's say um, all of that other stuff is being handled by other institutions. What is the role of the Fed? What what uh, what does it look like for the Fed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing? It, it means essentially, in my world, ideal world, it means are keeping an interest, maintaining the par value of the dollar, and maintaining an interest rate that is reasonable enough that will uh, allow borrowing to still occur and the economy to expand forward. So you're talking less about full employment and less about price level stability and more about financial sector stability well, no, no, no. or it's banking still, stability. It's still, it's still price oh, okay. stability, okay. right? Like it's still like it's maintaining the dollars, val the power value of your currency. It's about financing government debt. It's about all the, other, all the things the central bank does classically, right? And it I is see. about full employment, right? Uh, it is about like, maintaining that at a rate in which you maintain full employment. You know, there's other ways other than narrow or, you know, the way they do it now that you could do that. And I'm definitely not the person to talk to. I can about that. I mean, I can describe that, but I mean, that's not my area. There's like proposals to target and nominal GDP. There is like uh, floor G, uh, gross labor income uh, target, things like that, right? Uh, there are kinds of ways to think about what the ideal interest rate is, but the interest rate, it's a blunt instrument, right? It's a broadsword. It's not a scalpel. Um, fiscal policy or some kind of second order appropriation of fiscal policy, that is a scalpel, right? And I think we should be much more serious about its role. And we, I mean, we are now, like we really, I think have learned that, you know, central banks can't do everything. And when we force them to do everything, they just become fiscal agents, which, which requires a lot of thought about how these things are designed and what we want them to do. Yeah, if the, if the central bank is sticking to monetary policy and those are the only tools they have, then the only thing they can do is influence conditions in the financial sector. They can influence yeah. credit conditions and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and they don't have any control over how, you know, any of that lending or purchasing power is distributed or anything yeah, like yeah. that. I mean, yeah. and, you know, they've tried. I think there's been a lot of innovation. Like that's what these facilities were. They were like real innovations to try to target them. But even then, like this is, that's experimentation, right? Like we've, I think it's, you know, uh, I was asked recently because I was pushing for MLF like hard in my day job, right? As like an advocate and, you know, I, I didn't think it was a failure just because it wasn't used very much. I think there are a couple of reasons why I think even the signaling effect of it existing was useful for maintaining that market. But even more so, you know, we tried. We got the camel's nose under the tent. We learned something from it. 
And MLF right. is what you were talking about before, a municipal liquidity yeah. facility where you'd buy up, uh, the Fed would buy up the debt of Boston or something like that. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. Like, right? Like we tried it. We, we learned what it looks like on a small scale, what it would take. And you know, that's important information. Yeah. That's really important information to have. Like, uh, you know, um, so while not ideal, while in many ways very disappointing, at least it happened. And now next time there's a crisis, we will be ready. And hopefully we'll already have something that's not the Fed. It might be able to do that. Maybe we'll find out or we'll have other ways. Yeah, I think certainly um, with the coronavirus crisis, um, the Fed uh, responded more immediately with some of the stuff they initially kind of tried out with the 2008 crisis. So that yeah, was that was I, cool to see that evolution. Exactly, right? Like the things they learned in 2008, they jumped on with the yeah. coronavirus. They already knew what to do. Then a few months later, like with some thinking and with the congressional action and pressure, they added some other features, features that didn't really do that much. Like they, they weren't that successful, honestly, like in the way they were implemented. But, you know, they tried and it was an emergency. And now next time, maybe they'll be more effective or maybe we'll find out better ways to do that. Hopefully the latter, honestly. Right. Yeah. So so let's talk about um, interest rates and financial instability um, and the price level and how these things all relate to each other. Because right now um, we have interest rates on zero and we've expanded monetary policy even beyond that, you know, with, with QE buying assets and various other facilities. And um, so, so my question is, um, do you feel that, that there's kind of um, uh, maybe a higher level of interest rate target that, that corresponds with more uh, kind of financial sector stability, but we can't, we can't get there because it would be too deflationary given um, kind of current circumstances, that kind of thing? I mean, financial stability and the interest rates are loosely, I think, related, right? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, look, I think fundamentally in the end, all capitalist systems are financially unstable. Uh, so you're so that's Minsky right there coming that's out of you. Minsky, right? Yeah, like, you're saying or not, uh, you're going to have financial stability and expansion. Um, and you know, there there are two ways of looking at that. Do you want to avoid the instability uh, and you know build in like strong regulations, like make sure like do like sectoral balancing stuff, like targeting policies? You can do that. That's a good idea. Uh, or you could just accept it as normal, right? And make sure that the instability goes to something productive, you know? Um, you know, the dot-com bubble was an example of the economic instability. But you know what? We got a miles and miles of, of fiber, uh, fiber optic cable out of it. Um, and, you know, if you don't want as much instability, you want more government funding, of like that kind of stuff, and a lot of repression of the financial sector really like banking essentially just being like, for example, just for home loan, like for some stuff that's incredibly unrisky and the risk being taken on by the state. That's one way of going about it. Or you could just be pretty blunt about what capitalism is and say, okay, if we want the private sector to do these things and we might do that, they might do that better. They're gonna crash once in a while and we just need to make sure we clean up the, uh, clean up the mess. So um, would, you, would you say that it's not really possible to have strong economic growth um, without kind of this instability that goes along with it? Yeah, I mean, that's the classic Minsky tr tradition, right? There's always gonna be some instability. There's always probably gonna be some inflationary pressure when we have strong growth. And, you know, as a demic, like, that's normal. That's not a bad thing. Um, that's just living under capitalism. That's living in a, a con an accredited economy. Uh, yeah. Like the, the question is, if you don't want to have a credit economy, where are you going to like finance future? Where are you going to pull future cash flows out of, right? Because what credit is, is fundamentally just push, pulling cash flows that come into the future that are in the future into the present. Uh, yes. The future is always uncertain. So something's going to have to do that. So I think, um, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Um, I think to some extent there's a trade-off between private sector debt and public sector debt. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like public sector 
the, the, as I said, the way you stabilize an economy in many senses is you spend private sector, uh, pub, uh, public sector money. Either you do it during right. the fact that you have some kind of industrial planning regime, right? Or you do it after the fact and you clean up the private sector's mess. Yeah. Right. Via direct monetary, like fiscal, like via, you know, just giving people money and one probably is the fastest way, like other kinds of demand stimulates, stimulus, uh, restructure, public restructuring, all that good stuff. Right. But somewhere else, like that's, that's essentially it. There's always got to be a, you know, public balance sheet somewhere. Yeah. So, so Minsky talks about um, kind of a, uh, uh, increasing buildup of incoherence in the financial sector, uh, in the banking sector behind the scenes as, as private credit expands and you've got these interlocking balance sheets and IOUs, you know, like uh, eventually it, it becomes so interlocking and so interdependent that, you know, one default triggers another default and then you have a contagion and that's kind of the mechanism of, of financial true. collapse, right? Um, so I guess the, my question is, if you kept interest rates high enough, or if you kept credit conditions tight enough, could you keep the dominoes far enough apart that you'd never get to the case where you'd have this yeah, but then, cascading then you'd collapse? At, then you'd be at stasis. Would you be at, at you'd be and at actually, stasis? You'd be less at, than at stasis. You'd actually probably be going backwards because you still need some future cash flow expectation just to do amortization, just to do maintenance on it. But well, Minsky argued that the way to stabilize uh, or, or one way to stabilize would be to have businesses funded more by equity than by yeah, debt. Yeah, more out of equity, right? Yeah. That, that's definitely one way to do it, but equity can only get you so far. Okay, you so... Debt. So yeah, so yeah, so funding for people who are not following us, funding via equity via, uh, rather than debt, the idea is that you're, you're investing in your business with money that you already have rather than having to borrow it from somewhere else. So that if your business fails, there's no like uh, uh, debt default contagion or something yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, so, so I'm always thinking about basic income um, and you're talking about like, well, if you don't, you know, um, the trade-off between public sector debt and the private sector debt. Yeah, you, could, you, can, yeah. you can do it that way, right? Like that's fine. And that's actually, again, like one of the good things about a basic income policy is you can at least, you, you can incentivize risk-taking with more equity, right? Now yeah. the question is whether your basic income is gonna be high enough to buy like something that manufactures airplane wings or something. Well, the but question is whether it's, it's, yeah. Intensive products. Well, yeah, I mean, part of the question That's is really also, correct. there's always gonna be some level of debt, right? You just don't yeah. want necessarily um, the instability. Um, and yeah, then, and then yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like, and that's why I, I do think like basic income is not a bad idea. It forms a basic layer of equity. Yeah, I do think this that for expansion that that basic incomes either got to grow, 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 grow with the rate of the expansion of the rest of the economy uh, and some kind of rule, uh, and maybe even counter cyclically, or it's. Or, you know, you will need other sources of credit and not sources. Of well, that's that's certainly what I tend to advocate is yeah. kind of calibrating the basic income to um, to the level that's that's optimal for the economy. So yeah, yeah. As the, that, 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 yeah. that's a very good question as to what is the optimal level. Right, right. Um, but we can know how to kind of reach reach toward it um, if we yeah, increase the why, basic income. why I was saying, like, okay, in this world, we've gotten very close to communism. and We need a planner. We need like an objective industrial plan. If well, I think um, I think for for some government spending, uh, you certainly need that if they're doing projects on their own. For basic income, is this interesting hybrid, right? Because the government is allocating money to everyone, but then the market that that money is being used to um, allocate resources and goods and services in the in the market. Yeah, but then how do you know that that money that that money hasn't is now still worth the exact same uh, same at a different rate of profit? A different uh, combination of goods and resources. Well, you've you've got to still um, you've got to still design your policies uh, to be consistent with with price stability. So that means exactly yeah, right. Yeah, you may, I mean, I think if we're honest, the basic income policy probably has to be like is is inflation in some degree, right? I mean, you have to have well, it's a it's a source of 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 money for consumers, right? Um, right exactly, right. Yeah. So if you have more basic income, you have to have less of perhaps um, you know financial uh, uh, sector stimulus or less uh, wages or something like that or, yeah, uh, to balance it out. Yeah, like again, which is like what I was saying. Like, okay, and then we have to talk about who 
owns the surplus and how is that redistributed? Like, is it taxed yeah. away? Is it, you know, like that, right? That's not to me a basic income question. That is a bigger, bigger yeah. component of design question, right? And yeah, yeah. that has to be taxed away. You're going to have to tax either tax away the surplus or if your state's not nimble enough, which our state definitely isn't today, you're going to have to come up with some kind of ways of like, I don't know, like I, I think it would be very clever, for example, to like essentially just say like, yeah, um, um, it would be incredibly clever like to just like have the Fed give people variable savings accounts and adjust, you know, the interest rate on those instead of doing an economy wide like interest rate movement or something like that. There are all kinds of ways to do it. Yeah. All right, so we're at the end. Uh, are there any final thoughts you want to leave us with, uh, well, Yaakov? I would have loved to talk about this article because I really liked it. Yeah, um, it's. I, I recommend everybody uh, check out the article. Um, it, yeah, it, the, it, the link is in the um, is in the YouTube description. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think one of the one of the things one of the most important things you talk about in there is the. Um, the shift from wages to housing prices. So you have less um, consumer price inflation. Instead, you have asset inflation, yeah. including housing inflation. Um, and then you have homeowners becoming kind of like uh, a political contingent who you know, wants to protect the value of their homes. And that means perpetuating the situation which keeps wages down uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, is there maybe maybe just um, a few final comments on the article and 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 we can wrap yeah, up. I mean, yeah, what what I think is kind of neat about this, right, is you know you have your defla deflation deflation as you're like in, in, inflation hawks always freaking out about asset a uh, pricing for uh, inflation coming you know out of rates being too low, right? And you know like you know what Minsky kind of tells us is actually it's the other way around. If you're worried about asset price inflation, you've got to readjust the uh, productive relations, right? You've got to make sure that the main source of like that essentially most of that's going to the workers rather than the owners, right? Because then you just have the owners monetizing their assets because they're always going to have future cash flows, right? To like the, that's going to go to them, right? It's all about distribution at the end and redistribution. Um, and yeah, if you're, as I've said, I'm a fan of basic income. I think it makes sense. Uh, but like, you have to think about, okay, how do you calibrate it to make sure you don't actually mess that up? Right? This is all I ever think about, Yakov. Exactly. I know. <laughs> right. right. And yeah. then, you know, but in the end, I mean, that's, I think the potential of that is, you know, what some, if you are a serious socialist, for example, which I'm not saying I am, you know, Eventually, you like communism theoretically means as it does mean what you were saying. Like, right? It's like, well, that's in society in which there's no more wages, but there's still stuff being made. <laughs> I don't know if we'll yeah. ever get there. Uh, I don't think we will, but I think it's a continuum, and the the less people have to get their money through jobs, the uh, the freer they can be. Uh, so let's hope we we can move in that direction. All right. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Yaakov. No uh, thanks, Yaakov. Yep. Yep. Next week, we have a uh, philosopher, uh, Stephen Schaeferman, joining us to discuss his book, Our Future, The Basic Income Plan for Peace, Justice, Liberty, Democracy, and Personal Dignity. Uh, so looking forward uh, to that one. Thanks, guys. Okay.